All right. I hope you guys are ready to learn about some really cool animals uh, that you're going to see in just a few days. Well, two, three weeks. Um, let me, before I even get started though, let me show you a couple things. This is the PowerPoint. Um, the mammals on here are animals that I think we'll see almost all of them. And um, you're going to be responsible for IDing them uh, by sight. Uh, you're going to be responsible for the scientific names of the animals that uh, their scientific name is in red. For example, the Essionix jubatus. Uh, this is the cheetah. I think you can remember a cheetah. I'm pretty sure all of you would ID them, be able to ID them. But um, we're going to get to some, when we get into the antelopes, we'll probably, I'll probably be showing you a few that you've never seen before. But anytime the, the scientific name is in red, um, it's, uh, uh, that's a scientific name that I expect you to know. There's about 40, of, well, just a fewer than 48. Uh, on each slide, there's going to be a range map. Uh, this is the current range. This is the former range. Uh, before I even get started in that, I wanted to show you a couple books. Um, the first one is The Field Guide to Mammals. Um, this is the one I have, and I actually have the Kindle edition and the paperback. You can buy a hardcover as well. I am going to bring the Kindle edition. Uh, I may, since I paid for an extra box uh, bag, excuse me, bring the other one. But all of us are going to be restricted by weight. Um, so I'm trying to get you guys to go with electronic copies as much as possible. Although I'll be the first to admit I find a hard copy easier to use uh, and a little easier to read. So it's gonna, I'm going to leave that up to you. Um, the other one is the birds, uh, which is the second PowerPoint um, I'm going to go over. Uh, and this is a field companion to Robert's Birds of Southern Africa paperback. If you buy the field, if you buy the Robert's Birds of Southern Africa, it's going to be huge. Uh, it's a large book, really uh, well done, but it's not one you're going to be able to take into the field with you. Um, however, this book is light. It's narrow, um, and it, it will it will have all the birds I would I would think that that we will see. Um, the last thing I wanted you to look at is pronouncing those scientific names, uh, especially ones you've never heard before. Uh, you know, I worked with Ursus americanus for ten years. That's the black bear. I don't have any problem with how to pronounce that. Um, Asianix jubatus never done any work on that so I'm not too sure about it so um, I'm not unfamiliar um, with this site which is Google Translate now when you come and paste that name in there do yourself a favor and make sure it's in English if you have it in Latin here it's going to give you a real uh, accent Acinonic Subatus Jubatus so I don't think that's how you're going to want to say it. So go ahead and say it in English uh, and press the list. Asianonix jubitus. Asianix jubitus. So I wasn't saying jubitus. I was saying jubatus. Um, there are people I know in my business that argue uh, and Latin purists who say that Google Translate is not very accurate. All I know is it's going to be more accurate um, than you probably doing it on your own unless you uh, have taken a couple classes in Latin and really know how to pronounce it. Um, so Google Translate is translate.google.com and then you just start putting in the scientific names. Uh, if you're going to be using these terms professionally, uh, myself as an instructor, especially things like vertebrate ecology where I've got all these old dinosaurs, I do depend on this uh, and I still mess them up and I probably will anyway. So. Anyway, back to PowerPoint. I'm going to go right to the slideshow. Um, and as I said, there are there's a lot of memorization involved. Um, that's part of our business. And I know a lot of you guys are pre-vet and you think you may not need to know a bunch of scientific names. Well, you are. I, I've got a lot of friends, especially wildlife vets. Uh, and trust me, they know scientific names. 
And they unfortunately don't get to know scientific names of just mammals, great big beautiful mammals. They know ticks, they know scabies mites, they know everything else. So learning Latin names is a is learning how to learn Latin names is a learned. That's about four times in a row, isn't it? It's something you learn how to do. And um, what I would strongly suggest is what I'm doing right now. I have all these names on index cards. I have the English on one side, the Latin on the other. I already know what the animals look like. I've been doing this a while. Uh, but I just to make sure that I memorize them, and I will concentrate on five or ten each evening. Uh, spend 20 minutes on it, get through it. Uh, it'll make this a lot easier um, when you go. Now we're just going to be talking about mammalia, which is the, the mammal class. In the first order we're going to talk about is carnivora. And then we're going to go to Asianix jubatus, or jubatus, depending on who's pronouncing it. Um, each one of these will also have the status. Now, obviously the Endangered Species Act is an American thing, and a United States thing. So animals in other countries uh, don't have the same. Uh, and I don't know why this mouse is flickering. Unfortunately, uh, cheetahs are vulnerable, which is one step above uh, listed as endangered. Um, you can see their current range. Uh, look at their former range, all the way and through Asia, through India. Um, currently, there are some found in the Middle East, um, but they've really, really been restricted. Um, so this whole range was 1990. That's not that long ago, 120 years ago. Um, areas of high density. You can see that we're going to be very close to some areas of high density. Actually, the most are found in Namibia. Um, right now, the population is estimated about 7,500 animals, uh, maybe up to 10,000. They think that might be a little bit conservative. Um, they, as I said, they've disappeared from huge areas. Uh, if you just look at southern Africa, the estimated population is about 4,500 adults. Uh, Botswana has about 1,800. Uh, Mozambique less than 50. Namibia has 2,000. Uh, they have the largest population. South Africa 550. Zambia 100. And Zimbabwe 400. Um, there's also a big concern with cheetahs in that some genetic studies have determined uh, they're very inbred. There's not a lot of heterozygosity. Uh, there's been some recent work though that's done with um, some African uh, canids, dog family, and found that they're just as uh, low, a hydrozyg low a heterozygosity and therefore maybe this is more normal uh, maybe people are overreacting uh, and maybe cheetahs are a boom and bust species meaning they go through highs and lows whatever the case um, they are having some problems uh, survival of the young is, is low um, Population size, the effective population size. Hopefully you guys have had ecology and remember that term, and that's actually the number of breeders. Um, so may, you might have a thousand animals and maybe 40% of those are actual breeders. Uh, not all the males breed, uh, not all the females even breed. And, and some of that they think is due to uh, uh, genetics and some of it's due to it seemingly some female cheetahs are not very good at raising their young. Uh, cheetahs are the fastest land mammals. Um, they catch their prey, which are usually small to mid-sized ungulates. Um, gazelles uh, in, in the East Africa, uh, it'll probably be, it's primarily impalas, about 80% of their diet in South Africa. Uh, they'll also eat ground-dwelling birds, small mammals. Uh, they rarely scavenge. Uh, and unfortunately many times they lose their prey. This is a young impala that this mom actually ended up killing. She was trying. I, I actually got to watch this. These three kittens, uh, although you can't see them, um, she, she kind of wounded it and then let them um, tear into it and they didn't do a very good job so she finally grabbed it by the neck before it took off. Uh, it took 20 or 30 minutes before this animal died. So it, it's not always pretty but that is nature. Uh, Asianix jubatus. Some of these nice South African critters are real nice to us on the scientific name, and this one is this is the caracal. 
um, Caracal, Caracal. Um, and it's, it's essentially the African version, uh, and it even goes into, you can see it's, it has a very similar distribution to the former distribution of the cheetah. This is a smaller mammal. Uh, it doesn't need as large a prey. Uh, it's not, uh, livestock producers aren't near as concerned about it, although they certainly do trap them and kill them. Um, so it hasn't been eradicated uh, as the cheetah has, and it's a species of least concern. It's not a species uh, that they're concerned about. These, uh, these two pictures are actually of a younger caracal that I uh, found in South Africa. Uh, they can get larger than bobcat size. Um, they're not real dense. Uh, studies have found um, about one every four kilometers on the west coast of South Africa. They do occupy a wide variety of habitats um, from semi-desert to open savanna, scrubland, most moist woodland thicket. You'll get to see all of these real quick here. They prefer the drier areas. Uh, they do better there. Um, in the northern Africa though, in this area um, and in Central Asia, they are considered uh, threatened. Uh, and they are on the CITES Appendix 2 list. Uh, by the way, most of this information, the natural history information I'm going to talk about is from the IUCN, the International Union of Conservation Network. Um, it's biologists all over the world that actually put animals in different um, um, statuses. Um, this one, I don't know why it's not on the slide, but this, av this, this African wildcat is uh, a species of least concern. Um, now, you're saying, oh, what is he doing? He's showing us pictures of a house cat. He looks exactly like it, doesn't it? Um, and the first time I saw one, it was like, oh, Christ, somebody's cat got loose. This is an African wild cat. Uh, it's a different subspecies. There are wild cats in Europe. There are wild cats in Asia that look very much like this. Um, it's... It is a little larger than most domestic cats. It has longer hind legs. There are five different species, subspecies. Uh, some are considered, some of the species, subspecies are considered vulnerable. Uh, they are found throughout Southern Africa and ex except for extreme deserts. Uh, they're pretty nocturnal. Um, I was able to see two of them on night drives in Kruger, which we can talk about. Um, those are an additional cost, but they're, they're fairly uh, inexpensive that you can go with uh, with the rangers um, at the different camps that we're going to stay at. This is Leptalius Sable. This I fixed the spelling on that, and this should be Serval. I don't know why it's not coming up. Okay, I'll have to fix it again. Um, Leptalius Serval is uh, the Serval. Uh, it's a very different looking cat. Um, if we see one, it'll probably be at night. Uh, I saw one. I actually got to see them do this great hop that they're well known for. Um, they kind of pounce on things in grasslands. You see they have a very wide range. This red area though, they've gone extinct. So we probably won't see any um, in the East Cape region, which is going to be in here. Uh, but they certainly are, and I have seen them in Kruger. Um, it does occur uh, widely throughout uh, South Africa, though. Um, the status uh, in, within reserves, uh, they're not concerned about them, but the status outside of reserves, which are these parks, is uncertain. Uh, they're pretty inconspicuous. Um, they may be common in suitable habitat. They're pretty tolerant of farming, and they actually do well in agricultural areas. Um, uh, the density of a study that was done in Kenya in Nagoro Nagoro Crater was about one serval for every two kilometers, so they're even more dense than caracals. Uh, but they are found in more mesic, meaning wetter environments, um, riparian vegetation types. Alpine, they can found but be found all the way up into alpine grasslands. They do go into some of the dense forest, uh, riparian areas along riverways. Uh, but the major threat to servals uh, is wetland habitat loss, and it's 
we have the same we don't have any servals but we we're concerned about our wetlands in our own continent um, secondary importance the degradation of grasslands um, through annual burning you're going to get a lecture on fire ecology it's extremely important to have burning but not every year was not what these animals evolved with uh, and it can reduce uh, the habitat quality for them um, the legal commercial trade is general declining anytime you have a spotted cat this animals potentially could be used for coats uh, and just because it's illegal doesn't mean that it's not being done it's, it's unfortunately being done with leopards the bobcat in the United States is the only cat that it can be legally exported um, from the United States and, and a bobcat pelt right now is worth up to five hundred dollars um, but they are uh, persecuted for taking poultry uh, and indiscriminate predator control they just have traps out uh, they don't check them uh, frequently and the animals die in the trap the isolated population around the Mediterranean coast which is here uh, is considered endangered and is on CITES appendix 2 uh, they think there are fewer than 250 adults in that population that's bad you start getting that fewer animals you're in trouble uh, and they're slightly uh, separated from each other so the servals in this area are a concern in this area not as much I don't think anybody needs to know what this animal is it's Panthera leo uh, they are considered vulnerable uh, this is the historic distribution in red um, and you can see the blue the present distribution and it's pretty pitiful um, unfortunately lions have really declined in just the last 30 years which is three lion generations um, and it's it's been a cause of great concern for a lot of biologists uh, they think of, again a, about a 30 percent reduction in the, just the last 20 years uh, primarily indiscriminate killing um, by livestock owners um, and that includes uh, in Kenya uh, the Massey Mara um, and their prey base reduction has had some problem uh, unfortunately though I mean this is it's very difficult animals are very hard to count even animals that lay out in grasslands all day and sleep um, so it's been very difficult for them to determine you know what the lion population was versus what it is now I mean there are areas like Kruger where they've done you know substantial work uh, but most of Africa is not anything like that um, you know we're going to one of the flagship we're going to one of if not the flagship park as far as biology and what's known um, a lot of the areas even in the Serengeti is not near as much known uh, although the Serengeti has been well studied um, the estimate in 1980 was about 75 to 80,000 lions uh, 2002 it was about 39,000 lions which was almost a 50 percent decline um, that data again is an argument um, but uh, some people think it's is even less there's even less lions than 30,000 now um, just know and we'll go into this in depth uh, lion management uh, you're going to read about that uh, and the lion decline um, these are some specific numbers um, on what their estimate on West Africa Central Africa East Africa uh, and Southern Africa and so these are your uh, minimum and largest populations depending on which group uh, the African lion working group and the international I can't remember what this is the International Foundation for the Conservation of Wildlife Survey so again just be aware that uh, this is an animal that that is causing real problems anytime you have an animal that not only kills people um, but kills livestock um, people tend to go after it we're competing directly with them and you have to have and, and you're gonna read a series of papers in a book that tries to give you what it's like some idea of what it's like for these people who live with them 
But just understand that the whole world is asking a lot of very poor people to live with lions in their backyard. Uh, they used to live in Europe. They got rid of them. We used to have grizzly bears in Arizona. We got rid of them. So understand that people today are not reacting any differently than our ancestors did. Um, and it's a, it's a hard thing to do. I'm, I'm hoping lions just don't end up as a park animal, uh, but it, the potential is there. Okay, again, another one I doubt you have any difficulty uh, identifying. Uh, please remember that jaguars live in South America and Central America and not in Africa. This is the leopard, uh, and their spots are different. Um, Panthera pardus, uh, it's near threatened. Um, primarily uh, because of habitat destruction and uh, illegal killing um, for spotted coats. The leopards to me are fascinating in that as someone who studied mountain lions for seven years, leopards to me are just mountain lions with spots. They're extremely similar. Uh, their behavior is extremely similar. Um, they're not real dense anywhere they are, but they're found in all different types of habitat. Um, their habitat is their range uh, all through uh, southern Asia. They have really declined in Asia, uh, but not near as, as bad as, for example, lions. And understand that this animal is not near as big as a lion. They're not much bigger than a mountain lion. And, and this female she probably weighed 100 pounds. Certainly that's a, um, this male probably weighed about 130, 140. Uh, certainly that's a, a, an impressive animal, uh, but it's not a lion that's going to be taking, it's not, that's going to take down full grown cattle. Uh, they're primarily, well, where we're going to be uh, in Kruger, uh, and they're impala eaters, uh, almost 80%. I'm going to have a whole lecture on leopards, so I don't want to go too far into them. Uh, there really are no reliable continent-wide estimates. Uh, the most currently cited estimate is about 700,000 in Africa. Uh, in India, about 10,000. Uh, now, the Asian subspecies is, is red-listed, which means it's considered endangered. Uh, in Africa, they're most successful in woodland, grassland, savanna, and forest, uh, but they're also found in mountain habitats. Um, we're most likely to see a leopard, especially in Kruger, when we're, near, we're in a river bottom. Um, they, they need these trees uh, because they have to protect their, their kills, and they will pull them up in the tree. Uh, it's quite impressive to see. Uh, they have extremely Catholic diets, which includes more than 90 species. Uh, in Africa, they'll even eat insects uh, or an adult male eland, which are huge. Um, and again, they're killed by livestock owners as well. Um, and then that's Panthera pardus. A hyena, a spotted hyena, which is the arch enemy of the lion, Panthera leo. These are Crocutta crocutta. Um, this is an animal of least concern, uh, although they are persecuted. Uh, livestock owners, again. And when I'm talking about livestock owners, back up here a little bit, I, 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 pop, I apologize for wandering a little bit, but, uh, you know, there's so much to, to teach you. Um, understand that the livestock owners over there are not great big ranchers with huge gates and, and horses all over the place. Uh, most of them may have 20 or 30 cows. Uh, a lot of people, especially in the lions, they may bring them back to a boma every night. Uh, and the lions still get them or the leopards still get them. I mean, these people are, are poor. So if they see these animals or they have traps, they use them um, because the cattle are their livelihood. Um, viable population estimates of, of spotted hyena anywhere from up to 50,000. Uh, and the total global population could be as low as 27. So we really don't know that much on the numbers. Um, the spotted hyenas are present in all habitats, uh, semi-desert, savanna, open woodland, dense, dry woodland, even montane. Uh, they're found in the Ethiopian highlands up to 4,100 meters in altitude. 
Um, they're absent from extreme dry desert conditions. Um, and one of their cousin, the brown hyena, tends to fill that niche. Um, they are persecuted outside of protected areas um, and snaring uh, even in protected areas by poachers. Uh, not that they're they're hoping to eat a hyena, they just catch the animal indiscriminately. Uh, and uh, this mom is fine, she's sleeping. Uh, she's been at it all night with the two pups there. Uh, even though they're certainly less numerous than leopards, uh, they're not a species of concern because there's just not that much of a demand for them. Uh, this is the brown hyena, and I hope we get to see one. I'm not holding my breath. I did not get to see one in, in 2013 when I was there. Uh, they are closer related to the to the spotted hyena. Uh, they are here. You can see the range. This is in blue, so you don't have to memorize hyena brunea. You do have to memorize crocutta crocutta. Uh, they're primarily Namibian. The the highest density is along the Namib coast, which is here. Um, as you can see the area that we're going to be staying in, uh, it's really thicket. They're not near as, as often found there, but they are found up here in Kruger. Uh, so it is possible for us to see it. They're endemic to South Africa. Uh, just going in a little bit into Angola. Um, you know, when you read your history book, you'll learn that Namibia really separated from South Africa in about 1990. So it's not that long. Uh, they are found in desert areas with less than 100 millimeters, so um, 10 centimeters of rain. Uh, maximum rainfall of 700 millimeters, which why the area we're going to be in for quite a bit of time. Almost There's too much bush cover. Uh, they're primarily a scavenger. Um, they supplement their diet with wild fruits, insects, eggs, uh, occasionally small animal, which is killed some domestic livestock um, and they are persecuted for that they're often shot or poisoned uh, or hunted with dogs um, but they're really not most studies have found not found them to be a big livestock killer they're solitary very unlike the spotted hyena which is extremely social uh, they're solitary um, they do have an exceptional sense of smell and can find carcasses several kilometers away Many of you may not have seen this animal or heard of this animal before. It's really cool. It's the Ard Wolf. It is in the hyena family. And if you didn't realize, we are still in what there are two, two uh, subsets of, of carnivora. There's the Filiformia, which is the cat group. And then there's Caniformia, which is the dog group. These hyenas are in the cat group. So they are more closely related to cats than they are dogs. Uh, but the Ard Wolf is in the hyena family, hyena day. Um, they are a species of least concern. They used to be persecuted. They thought that obviously they're very dog-like looking. But these guys are termite eaters. And if you see these teeth, uh, you look up here and they really just have this uh, kind of ground area where they use that to grind up termites. They don't have the claws that uh, an aardvark has, and so they essentially uh, eat them when they're out on the ground, and this tongue with these ridges helps pick the uh, termites up. I'd love to see one. Uh, they're nocturnal. They're solitary. Um, they certainly are, are going to live uh, where we are. Um, but uh, they do compete with jackals a little bit, uh, though jackals aren't termite eaters. Uh, but their territory. Uh, in the summer, they may eat as many as 30 termites in the evening. Th no, not 30, 3,000, excuse me. Um, the prime habitat is open, pure grassy plains, uh, no forest, which is where the termites are. Uh, more in the, uh, the, Some termite mounds in the savanna woodlands, but not as much in the wetter areas. Uh, they were persecuted. They thought they killed chickens or small stock, but now farmers have finally begun to realize that this guy actually helps them out by eating termites. The problem is, is if you set a trap uh, and you use a scent to to get the animal, then you're going to have. If you want to help this animal, you're going to have to remove it um, 
You're going to have to have a control pole. A lot of these people live on two or three dollars a day. They're not going to have a control pole. They're just going to shoot the animal and they'll reopen their trap trying to kill a jackal or whatever they think might be eating their, their food. So uh, that is a concern. Um, population is considered very safe, especially inside the parks. Uh, they're very common in East Africa uh, and very common in Southern Africa as well. Not very common, but they're there. Excuse me, not going forward. All right, here's probably my favorite, uh, which is the wild dog, which is Lachyon pictus. Um, also called the African painted dog, for this beautiful coloration. Uh, I did get to see some in Kruger. I'm really hoping we do. If we see somebody in the East Cape area, they've just been, been put there. Uh, but wild dogs are, are voracious killers, voracious. They are considered the most successful predator. Uh, I've seen literature on them that, and, and I've got a, a lecture coming up on wild dogs as well, anywhere from 40 to 90 percent of their chases, they're successful. There's no other animal that that's successful. Um, unfortunately, their current population is somewhere between five and 6,000 animals, and there are a lot of people watching these, so they actually have good data on them. Um, of that five to 6,000, maybe only 1,500 of them are breeders, which is that effective population size. Um, and they're considered endangered, uh, very uh, completely protected, but people don't, uh, and, and in the rural areas, are not interested in protecting them. Uh, they're prone to marked fluctuations, and people are hoping that this is just a low and that they'll come back. They are very susceptible to diseases, canine distemper, rabies, uh, that's introduced by domestic dogs. Uh, they are generalist predators. Uh, they're very group, very social. Um, there's some good data, though, that once this pack size gets less than five to six, that that pack is probably going to go extinct. In other words, they're, they're just not going to make it. They're not going to be able to raise pups. Um, the pups are killed by lions, they're killed by leopards, they're killed by jackals, they're killed by um, all the other carnivores in the area, and, and so they need to have one dog back at the den to, to guard them. Uh, and when the pack size gets so small that everybody has to go to catch the wildebeest uh, or whatever they are. Um, if we see one, it's going to be moving fast and you won't see it for long. Um, I was lucky enough to watch them kill um, a young bush buck uh, and they had that, there was three of them and they had it eaten in less than 30 minutes. Uh, their average prey is about 50 kilograms and depending on where they are, whether it's East Africa uh, Botswana, here's the few that are in South Africa. There are just a few up here in Namibia. Zambia has got a good population. Zimbabwe, this is the amount of pools, large population there. And then Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, and these are the strongholds of these poor uh, animals. And uh, in, in uh, South Africa, the diet again is Impala. This is the black-backed jackal, Canis mesomelis. It's red, so says Laceon pictus. Um, this is an animal that I suspect we're going to see quite a few of, uh, at least if it's anything like when I was there. Um, they are a species of least concern, um, quite common. Uh, they're endemic to Africa, um, found in two different subpopulations. Uh, you have your East African population and then your Southern Africa population. Uh, generally widespread in Namibia and South Africa. Uh, they occur in livestock producing areas and they certainly will take advantage of livestock. Uh, found in a wide variety of habitats, extremely adaptable. Uh, they yip. It, it's different sounding than a coyote, but you will see, you will hear some similarities and I'm sure uh, you're going to hear somehow. Uh, there are really no major threats other than their persecution uh, by livestock people. Uh, they're extremely smart. Uh, they're very much like a coyote. I think a leopard's very much like a, uh, a mountain lion and a jackal, a blackback jackal, is, is very much like uh, a coyote. These are really cool. I've got to see them once. These are bat-eared foxes, Otocyon megalotus. Uh, they are a species of least concern. Here you see one very similar to the yard wolf eating termites. However, they Oh, this one's carrying a pup. 
they will eat small mer uh, vertebrates as well, small mammals, birds. Uh, they are found in the East Cape area. Uh, if we see any, in the, I, well, I just about find it impossible we'll see any in the daytime. Extremely nocturnal, um, and especially since it's during the winter, their winter, I doubt if we'll do. But they do have those huge bat-shaped wings, um, winged ears, 14 centimeters in length. Uh, majority is invertebrates of their diet, invertebrates, but they do pick up some of the vertebrates. Uh, these large ears allow, actually allow them to hear ants and termites walking and digging. Um, they are occasionally persecuted. However, just like the aardwolf, farmers are now beginning to realize that, hey, these things provide a benefit. Um, they kill termites that are eating grasses that my livestock must might eat. Uh, they're, uh, uh, and they're somewhat social. Um, the group I saw saw about eight animals in it. So, side stripe jackal. This is an animal I'll be surprised if we see, but they are in Kruger, which is, if you're getting the hint, it's right up here on the Mozambique line. Um, Canis of Justice. Uh, they are uh, very similar to the blackback jackal. Uh, bush, grassland, woodland, marsh, mountain. Uh, generally avoids exposed savanna, even though that's where these pictures are from. These aren't pictures I took because I didn't see any. Um, and uh, so that's why we probably won't see as many. Um, and the blackback jackal out competes them. Um, this is one that we might see in the Cape, in the East Cape area, and that's Volpe's chama. Excuse me, which is a Cape fox. By the way, these uh, uh, hyperlinks here goes to this map. I was originally going to go through all these and have you guys look at the map, and then I went through and, and uh, screenshot them and, and put them on this slide. Um, ears are big, but they're certainly not as big as the bat-eared fox. It's the only true fox um, found in Africa. Uh, they'll eat uh, wild fruits, vegetables, just like our own foxes. They also eat a lot of small prey, small mammals. They'll eat invertebrates, beetles, grasshoppers. Um, they're not a cooperative hunter. They're in uh, Cape Fox is a solitary nocturnal forager. So unlike a lot of canids uh, in Africa, they're not solitary. All right, here's some different animals that you may or may not be familiar with. The first is the African civet, Civetica civeta. Again, those nice scientific names. Wait till we get to the antelope. You can see that they have a huge range, widely distributed. Uh, they are, again, trapped for their spots. They're not a cat, though. Uh, they're actually more in the Canidae, uh, Caniformes. Um, they are a species of least concern. Wide variety of habitats, very common in West and Central Africa. They, uh, they go right into the jungle. Um, but I did see a civet uh, in Kruger at night. Uh, there are really no major threats. Uh, although, in, especially in Central Africa, they are used for bushmeat. Um, people like to eat them, um, especially in areas like Nigeria and, and Ethiopia. This, uh, obviously I saw this one since I took this picture. This is a genet. Um, this is Geneta Geneta. Again, now note here that the common name has one T and the scientific name has two T's. I looked that up twice. Uh, this is a very young genet. Uh, they will, you can possibly see them leaping in between trees. Uh, it's along with bush babies. It's quite impressive. Um, the common genet prefers all types of wooded habitats associated with rivers, uh, but it's a generalist in uh, wherever it can find suitable prey. Uh, it's a small carnivore though. Um, they're pretty scarce in areas like the Serengeti. Uh, so they're going to be found in more fragmented woodlands. And you can see this one was up in a tree. This was in Savannah Woodland uh, where I saw that one. Janetta, Janetta. The Cape Janet um, is possible to find in the East Cape uh, when they were at Amakala. Um, 
I'm going to let Dan tell us the difference. Uh, I would have to really look at the book and have the animal in my hand. Uh, they're endemic to South Africa, uh, higher rainfall areas, um, most in well-watered zones, uh, sometimes killed by farmers, uh, but they have no real uh, enemies by a, a man. Uh, tree, small small mammals, small birds, insect eating. Um, now her pest today, which is the mongoose family and the circuits, there are seven species. Uh, the banded, the yellow, the slender, the white-tailed, the dwarf, the cape gray, and the marsh. And no, I'm not going to make you memorize them all. These guys are really cool. I'd love to see them. Uh, that's not even on our list, though. We might see those in Kruger. They're not found in the East Cape area. The two that we're going to look at are the that I'm sure we're going to see are the yellow and the Cape Gray. Um, we'll probably see them at night. Uh, although I did see several yellow mongooses. Uh, and then when we get to uh, Kruger, uh, banded mongoose are probably going to be pretty common. And I did see one slender. Uh, the two that I am going to ask you to learn the scientific names for are Synictus peninsulata, which is the yellow mongoose. Uh, very common. I've seen them in grasslands. I've seen them in deserts. Uh, they use burrows, rocky hard soils, primarily insectivorous. They will hunt rodents, birds. And then the Cape Gray mongoose, Herpestus pulverulentes. That's why you use that. Uh, thing before you give a lecture. Uh, anyway, I'm losing my ability to pronounce here. Very wide habitat tolerances, dense bush, thicket, short vegetation, um, eats anything, which is what a Catholic diet means. Uh, be able to ID, be able to ID these two too, which are the the the, bi, the banded, uh, which I don't expect you to know the scientific name, and the white tail. Now this white tailed mongoose. Uh, the two I saw were at night, and these tails are huge. Um, and it, it looked, I, I thought for a second, it was like, what, is that a skunk? Uh, and there are some skunk-like animals, which we're going to come up to next. But, I mean, the, the tails, uh, if the animal holds it up, the tail is, the hair, is, the fur is really long. Very impressive young little animal. All right, maybe this is your favorite, the, the meerkat. A very, very nice Scientific name for memorization, Suricata. Notice that the genus has one T and the, sub, the species has two. I looked that up as well. Uh, they're a social animal. Um, this was a group that I found at Addo. Um, and in the early morning, they're all running around the elephant dung here looking for um, uh, insects. Uh, and then they leave their den area and go off and hunt, and maybe make a one to two kilometer uh, route. Uh, they can fluctuate greatly. Uh, the biggest population is in the Kalahari, uh, which we're not going to visit this year. Uh, they are carnivorous, but they mostly eat uh, invertebrates. Mustelids. All right, three of them that you have to know. Honey badgers, Melovora, Capensis. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the U-Term film. Um, I think if you push on one of these, I think it's this one, it even goes to that YouTube. Um, the striped weasel, I'm not asking you to know the scientific name or the striped polecat, but I would be able to expect you to ID them. The striped weasel has going to have a totally white cap on its head. It's much, much smaller. You're not going to confuse it with the honey badger. It's a fair-sized animal. This is very uh, weasel size, skunk size, and then the striped polecat. And I've also got a picture here of a clawless otter, uh, which we could see uh, in East Cape, uh, but uh, I, I have to limit somewhere. Um, the striped polecats, uh, I've seen a couple of them, uh, very skunk looking, and they do have a, a spray. Um, but not quite as bad. All right, we're leaving Carnivora. We're heading into Probiscidae, uh, which is the elephant family. Uh, we're going to have one species, uh, a very cool species, which will you will become quite enchanted with when we're there, uh, and that's Loxodonna africana. Uh, and that's the African elephant. Uh, they're vulnerable. 
Um, and one of you will be working on a uh, issue PowerPoint that talks about the differences in between South African elephant populations and East African elephant populations, and there's a significant difference. And you're going to hear a lot about it, so I'm not going to go into extensive detail right now. But just realize that in, in the South African area, elephants are overpopulated. And you're going to hear a lot of talk about how elephants need to be regulated. Uh, they call it culling. Uh, and there's a lot of argument going on. Uh, a lot of people working at, at different ways um, to sterilize these animals. And, uh, you know, the majority of the females, um, do they call young animals? It's, and, and I'm going to let Dr. Parker get into it, but it's, it's a huge problem. These guys are biotic bulldozers. They just, they control what grows. They eat four, two to five hundred pounds of vegetation a day. Uh, they produce 300 pounds of dung. Um, they, they control that ecosystem. And, and therefore, when they become overpopulated, it can become a problem. And I'm sure all you have heard about nothing but elephant poaching and elephants going extinct. And you can find that all over the Internet. But the only place that's even coming close to happening is in East Africa. It is not happening in Southern Africa. These things are killing two to three hundred people a day, a year, excuse me, not a day, uh, uh, going into their gardens. and uh, They don't like people. Just, just get that straight right now. They don't like you. Do not get out of the car. You will not outrun them. Uh, and, and it's not pretty uh, when they decide to kill someone. Um, we will spend a lot of time, I'm hoping, at this particular water hole. This is Harpur in Addo Elephant Park. Uh, and it was fascinating for me to spend a couple evenings there and watch the social. Uh, here you can see there's a GPS collar on one of these animals. Uh, this is the Addo Elephant Park. Um, well, it's actually right. Yeah, that's it right there. Uh, and then you have the Kruger population here. Uh, you can see that their population is certainly much, much limited as to what it was. I'm not going to argue that at all. But within parks, uh, the populations are huge. Okay, we're out of Perbicidae. Now we're going into Parasodactyla, which are the odd-toed odd -toed ungulates, which Dr. Miller is going to talk about the difference between Parasodactyla and Artiodactyla, at least as herbivores. Uh, the two that you're going to be most, well, there's actually three species, two zebra species, and, and two rhino species uh, that you'll be learning. Um, Let's look at the first one, and that's virtual zebra, Equus quagga virtuli. Uh, it's a species of least concern. Uh, this photograph is from Namibia, uh, coming into a water hole. Uh, this was up here in Atasha. Um, we will see them in, in the East Cape, uh, but they, they have been moved there and put on game reserves. Uh, game reserves in South Africa mean an area like we're going to stay at in Almakala, where the animals are are tended to and they're there for tourist for ecotourism. Uh, a park obviously is a uh, you know a, the South African Parks National Park Service park system excuse me not surface um, is the uh, area of South Africa where large animals are where animals are protected but game parks um, Private game parks are where animals are raised for meat and hide, uh, and that's that's a big business, and we'll talk about that as well when we're there. Uh, the virtual zebra, uh, they don't have any orange on their face. Uh, there are no stripes don't extend in the stripes do extend into the belly, uh, and there's no dewlap. And I'll show you a dewlap now because you're going to show we're going to go right on to the, the mountain zebra. Uh, Total estimate now is somewhere between six and seven hundred thousand uh, virtual zebra. Uh, the Serengeti population is the largest. There's twenty to thirty thousand zebras in uh, Kruger. You're not gonna have, you're not gonna miss them, and they're gorgeous. I, I really uh, this again is a Natasha. Uh, this is in uh, Addo or Mountain Zebra. I can't remember. And this is in Kruger. Um, the I, I don't know. I saw them in zoos, and I thought, yeah, they're kind of cool, and I own horses for 30 years. Uh, but when you see them out on the plains, they are really beautiful. This is my favorite, though. This is the mountain zebra, 
uh, Equus Zebra Zebra, what a good scientific name, right? See where I said the nor orange on the face? That's pretty distinctive. Birchels, and then you have the orange of mountain zebra. The only play, and then the stripes do not extend into the belly uh, on these guys here. She's pregnant. And um, the area where we are going to see mountain zebra is right here. Uh, and you can see they've been transplanted several different places. These are the mountain zebra. These actually are the, um, they are listed as vulnerable. They were, mountain zebra were listed as extinct, uh, but they've done an excellent job of, of, of increasing them. The current population size of mountain zebras is estimated at about 1,500 to 2,000 animals. The Hartman mountain zebra, which are up here and in Namibia, uh, are related as about 25,000. Uh, the only concern about Hartman zebra, it's just a different subspecies, Equa zebra, uh, that they are raised uh, and they are used commercially. Their hides are sold uh, and they're raised for meat, and this is off of parks. Um, so people are going out and hunting these animals to provide themselves an income. That doesn't happen with mountain zebras in South Africa. This is a, a dewlap. Um, this is just an area. Uh, you're going to see a couple other antelope species that have this kind of a fold of skin uh, that kind of hangs down underneath their chin. All right, rhino serrata day. We got out of Equiday. This is the black rhino. This is the one that you really, really, really don't want to deal with. Uh, black rhinos uh, have a pointed, hooked mouth. White rhinos. This is a white rhino, this is not a black, have a wide mouth. In fact, white rhinos, the, mount, the name, and, and this is controversy whether or not, but many people think that early colonists called them wide rhinos, and then that somehow got changed to white. Um, but the mouths are completely different. The white rhino will usually be with a lot of other animals. The black rhino will usually be solitary. This is a black rhino at night. Um, this is in Namibia. I don't know that we're going to see one. Uh, this is former range. Um, this is current range, but their numbers are so low. Uh, the, we're going to go in, into the poaching problem in depth. Um, it could have been as high as um, uh, 850,000 uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, now they estimate about 630 in Namibia um, by the end of 2010, uh, but they're killing uh, a thousand to two uh, rhinos a year. And the problem is there's been so much civil unrest in Mozambique and Angola. Uh, here's Mozambique and here's Angola. Uh, and just the number of guns that, that found their way into these countries and then found their way into the reserves and these horns are worth thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars and and people are willing to risk their life daily uh, to go out and kill these animals because uh, they'll make more in, in uh, one night than they can make in a couple of years so <clears throat> we'll go into that in depth as well white rhinos again very wide mouth primarily going to be more in the open area uh, a black rhino is a browser as a browser White rhino is a grazer. You can see them eating grass here. This one got cut in a fight. Uh, that is this guy right here, that same rhino. Uh, they're near threatened, but they're going to be probably endangered real quick. Uh, right now, the, they're, they were almost gone. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, so in the 1800s, uh, they were only found in one area of South Africa. Um, south of Kruger uh, and they were protected uh, they were transplanted to other areas like Kruger uh, and they did really well and in at 2010 they estimated close to 20,000 individuals however now uh, with about a thousand a year being killed let's look here um, 2007 to 2011 122 333 448 were poached um, and 600 by the end of 2012, um, 
in uh, over a thousand for the last two years. It's it's really a crime. All right, artiodactyl, which is the even-toed ungulates, uh, much more common than parasodactyls, much more efficient digesters of vegetation. So they're found in more areas. Here's one that I hate pronouncing, Thacocaris africanus. I got through it. This is a warthog. Yes, a hog is an artiodactyla. It's an even-toed ungulate. We'll see lots of them. Their tails will be up. I don't have a picture of them running with their tails up. They frequently get down on their knees here to eat, to graze. They have these huge tusks uh, they use for protection. Uh, two big males here. Uh, one was in Kruger. This was in um, Mountain Zebra National Park. Um, so we will see them, um, and quite frequently. This is a bush pig. Ponomocaris lavardus. You don't have to know that name. Least concern. Uh, they, I did not see one. They are extremely nocturnal. I know they exist. I know they're out there. They're certainly in Kruger. They're certainly in the East Cape. Never saw one. Uh, they do not have the huge tusk like the warthog do. The warthog are, are diurnal. The bush pigs are, di are nocturnal. Uh, maybe we'll get lucky and see one. This one I hope I don't have to ID for you. Uh, Hippopotamus amphibious, pretty easy scientific name. Social animal, uh, but they're considered vulnerable. And uh, that somewhat surprised me, um, but it, it's really a habitat loss problem. Um, they, although 96, they were considered uh, widespread and secure, uh, but there's been several key changes in key countries, um, anywhere from a 20% decline uh, just like the lions, um, and it's primarily in countries like Uganda, Mozambique, and Zambia, Zimbabwe, areas where there is a lot of internal strife, uh, and people are shooting them because the guns are available. They are dangerous to human beings. This is not an animal you want to run into at night. Uh, they tend to get scared and run people over. They have no, they're, they're completely herbivorous. They have no intention of killing you and eating you. Uh, but they get scared and they run over things. Uh, so in all these countries where there's not stable uh, governments, there's not really a stable wildlife population. And so wetlands are being drained. Um, all different kinds of things are happening. Um, South Africa does have flourishing populations. Zambia uh, so it has the biggest population, about 40,000. Um, it was in Beek, 16,000 to 20, Mal Malawi, 10,000, Zimbabwe, about 7,000, South Africa, about 5,000. Uh, they are very amphibious. Uh, they'll be in the water during the day, and they will be out in the bush at night. Um, so they leave the water, they lay around like this, uh, and then they'll come out at night. But we'll cover um, hippos more often. Giraffa camelopardalis, got it. Uh, don't think I need to ID this one for you either. Uh, population is considered stable, about 100,000 individuals in the African continent, way down from what they used to be. Uh, they're just not really a market for them, um, so there's not anybody going out to kill them. Primarily a savanna woodland species, obviously they're tree eaters. Um, I'll talk about them in depth. It's one of my favorite animals in the world. Uh, it, they're a real example of, of natural selection and how some adaptations are so hard to come by. Uh, but for a giraffe to be able to do what it does, uh, in other words, get pumped blood to its head, keep blood um, coming back up from the legs into the heart, uh, there's some dramatic adaptations that evolved and, and, and it's really cool to learn about. Heart of beast. So we're, now we're going into the family Bova day. We've come out of giraffe a day. Um, and hippopotamus day, uh, sua day, which were the pigs, and now we're into bovids. And this is going to be the last family we come. And this is heart of beast. Notice these different colors here on this map. These are all now considered different subspecies. Uh, this is Cama, that the one that we will see, uh, Acephalus bucephalus Cama. Uh, this is a, now this is the same subspecies, all the color is different. This is in Namibia. That's Canis what? You guys remember? 
Remember? All right, this is the heart of beast. Some people call them red heart beast in South Africa. Some people call them Lexus Nines when you get up into Zambia. Zambia, Zambia. Um, male and the female here. Um, not numerous, but not uncommon at all. Um, total population now is estimated at, at over 350,000. Uh, quite a few in East Africa, about 100,000, 130,000. Quite a bit of those are on private land, uh, so there's some concern about them. Um, but um, they and they are harvested for meat. Apparently, they're quite tasty. But again, there's quite a few in protected areas as well. 60% of the population. So the long-term uh, prognosis for this is is not as dire as some of the other species that we've talked about. Conchetus tyrannus. This is the common or blue wildebeest. This is the one that's found in the Serengeti, which we are not going to visit. We will see blue wildebeest, though. We will see both. We will see black and blue. We will only see blue wildebeest, common wildebeest, in Kruger. Uh, if we see them down in the southern area, South Africa, somebody has transplanted them there. That's not their native range. Um, but it's also called the new uh, it's listed as a least concern. There's over a million of them in the Serengeti, a uh, million and a half on the African continent. Um, Serengeti population, excuse me, is 1.3 million right now. Um, the blue wildebeest, which is mainly the South African one subspecies, is five to 10,000. Um, they have an interesting, although there's probably 20,000 on Kruger. Uh, very important animal in Kruger, very interesting biology, and we'll go into them in depth. This is the black, and again, Conectatus, no. Uh, least concern, uh, this is Amakala, and these are three, there's a heart beast, and there are three black wildebeest. This is Amakala, no, this is uh, uh, Addo, no, this is Mountain Zebra, and this is Amakala as well. And this is an area where you'll actually be able to get out of the vehicle because there's no elephants, there's no lions, there's no leopards, etc. in this particular area. This is a South African wildebeest. And um, so uh, they're also called the white tails. They're also found in Swaziland, which is over here, and Lesotho, which is right here. Um, there are very few left uh, when the... Cape was colonized here uh, and people began to spread out throughout South Africa. These animals aren't incredibly intelligent uh, and they were easy to shoot and apparently they're quite tasty and they were almost wiped out especially around the Cape uh, and because of protection they were able to reestablish them. That's the black wildebeest. So if you see that blonde tail it's a black. If you see a black tail it's a common or blue wildebeest. Blessbach. We'll see lots of these. This is at Mountain Zebra National Park. I don't know that we'll see them anyplace else. Um, they're not really found in Kruger. Um, very, very few numbers. This is a Bontebok, which we shouldn't see. Uh, this is the difference between Blessbok and Bontebok. Um, since I've already been speaking for an hour, I'm not going to go into great detail. These are more purplish. The white on the head is, is not separated as it is in the Blessbok, but in, and the Blessbok is more of an orange animal. Uh, a species of least concern, um, and these are, di they used to be different species, uh, Damaliscus pygaris, but they now are considered do two different species, and there's probably about a quarter of a million of them. Um, and the Bonobok, very much like the black wildebeest, just about were extinct uh, by early Cape colonists, uh, and now are, are doing better, not great. The Blessbok are doing very well, it's about uh, 200 and 20,000 of Blessbach. This is the South African uh, country animal. This is the springbok. We are not going to see a lot of these. Um, we'll see them at Mountain Zebra. Um, we could see some in Amakala. I don't know if they have them there. They're more common of a desert animal, Antidorcus marsupialis. You can see they're very common in, in Namibia. This is an animal that can go without free water. Uh, very, very well adapted, uh, very, very social animal, very large groups, uh, fight a lot. I watched these two go at it for at least 30 minutes. I was 
the jackals were starting to gather around them. I really thought one of them was going to die. Um, and uh, they're just very, they're a smaller antelope. Uh, this is a young one with that short face. Uh, not great horns. Uh, they're wonderful to eat. Uh, a lot of people raise springbok just like they do cattle in the United States. Uh, that's something that you're going to have to get, realize. I know, Abby, you're a vegetarian, but everybody else is a meat eater, and you're probably going to eat most of the animals that you think are cool, uh, except for the carnivores, um, because a lot of them are raised for food, and sometimes it's, it's, it's cheaper um, to buy game meat than it is to buy uh, beef. So uh, I would almost bet you that springbok is going to be on the menu a few times uh, because they're raised, and they're quite, quite easy to raise. They're quite easy to uh, domesticate. This is a clip springer, or a tagus, or a tagus. Uh, this is a mountain dweller. I'm really hoping we see uh, some over in, in Kruger uh, in the north, which we're going to be spending a couple days. There's some rocky, large rocky outcrops in that area of the Kruger. Uh, I did not see one, but I did not get up there in 2013. Uh, very small antelope, uh, probably about three feet tall. Short horns, the females do not have horns, although the northern population, some of the females do have horns. Uh, they walk on their tiptoes, you can see here, um, and they're found at very high elevations up to 4,380 in Ethiopia, uh, which is where, over here, um, uh, Kenya. Um, and they have to have those rocks. They're, they're kind of like our bighorn sheep habitat. Uh, they, they, they uh, like that. This is an Oribe, and I didn't see one of these as well, but I know that it's possible for us to see it. Um, they are going to be in the very southern part of Kruger. Uh, here's Mozambique. Um, it's not one that I expect you to see. Um, you're going to see an animal that looks a lot like it, called the Stienbach, which we'll come to next. Um, but it's, uh, it's an Oribe. Um, estimated at 750,000. So again, it's another, another smaller animal, two or three feet tall, uh, not large, um, and, but they do very well and, and they live with humans very well, live in agricultural areas well. This is the one that we're going to see more often. This is the Stenby. Sten, this is not a Steenbach, which is how I pronounced it before I got there. It's a Stenbach. And you can see how small it is. I mean, it's, it's shorter than the grass. Uh, I was very excited when I finally got one without grass in front of its face. Uh, very common throughout the area. Uh, they do have this distinct distribution. Uh, they are very, very what we call disjunct. Raphaceris campestris, uh, about 600,000 individuals, but that's considered by the, uh, the IUCN as an underestimate. Uh, they think there could be as many as a million. They uh, somewhat like to see... Uh, the springbok are, are pretty much water independent, uh, but they're not quite the desert dweller that a springbok is. Uh, very, very common in parks and very, very common on private land because they really don't compete with livestock. Sincerus kafer, we will discuss these at length. This is the African buffalo. Uh, I learned it as the Cape buffalo. They don't call it that anymore. They call it the African buffalo, Sincerus kafer. Um, they're going to look at you like you owe them money. I mean, I've never seen one that didn't look at you like, get out of my way. And they have that attitude. And they are one of the big five because they do kill people. Uh, they're huge. Uh, population right now is estimated at close to 850,000. Found in a tremendous variety of habitats. Um, they're a great facilitator. Uh, and we'll go into that in depth, meaning they, they help other animals get the vegetation they need. Um, they have been through some severe collapses, which we'll discuss in depth, uh, from diseases. Uh, and there's a large push now to create uh, disease-free African buffalo. And uh, they uh, will not... Uh, they, they're getting some prime dollars for that. Uh, one of bull was just sold for three and a half million dollars. So very large, wide horns that hunters like. Um, 
the papers I read about buffalo, they're not concerned about them because the demand for hunting is so high that people are going to make room for them. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is the Nyala, Tregalaphus and Gazi. Now we're going to learn four different Tregalaphus, uh, so four different antelope that are very closely related with the same called congeneric species, same genus. Um, they're really gorgeous. And this guy, unfortunately, you can't see his kind of reddish brown socks. Uh, but this is the, the buck or the bull. Some people call them bulls. Uh, they are going to be found in northern Kruger. I fully expect us to see Nyala, but not in the East Cape. Uh, this is one, the, the Tregalaphus, this particular family, they do this. This is a, a type of display. Uh, this was two males. You can see the oxpecker there on one of them. We're kind of squaring off, and uh, they kind of show each other how high their hair can go, and they avoid fighting that way. The females are no horns um, and, and white lines uh, with some spots. They're quite attractive as well. But the Nyala is, is, when you see one, I think you'll be very impressed. The Eland is also very impressive, not because of its beautiful coat, but because of its size. Uh, again, this is a Tregalaphus orcs. Uh, this is the largest antelope. Um, total estimated numbers about 150,000. Um, they were much more common. Uh, they have been shot uh, quite a bit for food. And um, many people, uh, I, when I was in college at University of Wyoming, I had a professor that worked in Africa on elephants. And he really thought that the eland were going to become the livestock of the future in Africa. So that was in the 70s. Well, that hasn't happened yet, but it's still talked about. Uh, the problem with it is they're extremely athletic animal. So you can put up a really high fence, and they'll just walk up to a 7-foot high fence and jump it. Uh, and they're huge. Um, they're found from grasslands on up into uh, 4,900 4, meters. Habitat loss due to sell, uh, settlement and poaching is the reason for the decline in numbers over the last 50 years. And again, guns being more available to poor people has really increased poaching in some of these areas. So, um, Tregalaphus scriptus, this is the bush buck. Very, very similar looking, uh, at least the female is, to the Nyala. However, the male is, is not near as, as, as decorated. doesn't have the nice brown socks. They're also quite a bit smaller. Uh, they're probably a foot to a foot and a half shorter. Bush bucks are extremely common. Numbers are estimated, the IUCN estimated 1,340,000, 1, probably a conservative estimate. Uh, they are found just about in all habitat height types in sub-Saharan Africa. They remind me of our white-tailed deer. They seem to adapt very well to humans. They seem to adapt very well to all different kinds of habitats. Humans can change the habitats, and they'll find a way to make good in it. The thing bush bucks do require is, is thick areas. Um, it's rare to see them out on the grassland like this. Uh, these were two displaying males during the rut. Um, and they really are very common in, in thick vegetation, riparian vegetation. Leopards love them <clears throat> because that's where leopards live. This is a species that will certainly get your attention. This is the greater kudu, um, Tregalaphus streptocereus. Uh, um, I'm getting worse. There again, another browser. Uh, look at these big horns. Uh, females do not have that. Um, females much smaller, somewhat similar looking in the gray with the white stripes. Um, total population estimates are about half a million, 15% in protected areas, which is a concern. However, um, in the conservation papers I read on these animals, that people are not as concerned about them because they are such a sporting animal, meaning there are a large number of Europeans and North Americans who are willing to spend a tremendous amount of money to come to Africa and kill one of these things so they can put the head on the wall. 
which means that people will continue to preserve them, to continue to keep them on their ranches. They will not see them as a competitor with their livestock. They'll know how much they're valued at. Um, and so the kudu is, is probably got a positive outlook for the future um, as long as they don't get some of the, the, the diseases. So a diker. Um, and we're going to learn, this is the red forest diker. You can see that they're found right here um, in, in, on Southern Kruger. I don't think we'll see one. I just wanted to show you one. Uh, this is one that was killed and you can see that I put that picture in there so you can see. Uh, this is a female. She's got the very end of her spots there. Um, I just crawled up into the brush to get that picture. She was extremely tame. Um, and this was an area that was fenced so I, I didn't get out of the car. Uh, but um, population estimates about 50,000, which isn't bad for such a restricted range. Uh, they are concerned about habitat loss, just like everything else. Uh, but at right now, they're a species of least concern. This one we'll see quite often, um, Slivocapa grimia. This is the common diker. Uh, and people argue whether these impala or the bush buck are the most numerous antelope in Africa. Uh, IUCN estimate of the common diker, you can see how small they are, um, is estimated at 1.66 million, which they think is a conservative figure and one, as one scientist thought they were a 10 million. But it, I, I, I think most would say this is the most common antelope. They are a savanna, of savanna woodland species. Uh, found in very open country. Um, this was this was on Anamakala. Guy kind of walked up to us in the car. So I would certainly expect you to see some diker. Um, very popular among leopards, wild dogs. Uh, it's, a, it's a smaller prey. All right. These next two are Hippotragus. You don't have to know, but I do not expect you to be able to ID a roan from a picture and a sable antelope from a picture. This is the roan, and I'm not going to go into it um, right now, but these guys have really dramatically declined and almost extinct on the Kruger. Uh, and you heard me say on the Kruger. That's how South Africans call it, so that's why I say it. But there they are. That, that is part of their range. There are some on farms around Mountain Zebra, so we very well may see them there. Uh, they're very water dependent. They are a grazer. Uh, they're a low density species um, and the, the roan and the sable which are dramatically um, to me anyway just a gorgeous animal uh, the males are black with these extremely large horns the females are more red um, but uh, the sable antelope is uh, currently estimated only about 75,000 on the Kruger uh, the roan and the sable are probably down to about 20 to 30 animals a piece uh, where they used to be one of the more numerous antelopes and we'll discuss that in depth when we're in country but it, it's somewhat similar to the kudu the conservation network feels somewhat positive about the future of sable and roans because of the demand for them as a sport hunting animal so uh, whether you agree with hunting or not the fact that hunters put so much money into the economy is actually doing well to save these animals uh, and make sure that habitat is preserved. And every time habitat is preserved for a sable, every time habitat is preserved for a roan, it's also prever preserved habitat for impalas, common dikers, uh, baboons, uh, it, it just a large number of animals. So um, it, it's this is probably, along with the kudu and the roan and the sable, the fourth most sought after trophy. However, this guy is doing very well. And this is probably, well, other than the Ayala, this is my favorite antelope. Anybody who took Bio360 from me knows I speak a lot about them. They're the most well adapted animal to the desert uh, in the world. Uh, gorgeous, large antelope, Oryx gazella. Uh, we should see some uh, in the East Cape area. I did see them on Addo, not Addo, I did see them on Mountain Zebra. They will not, we will not see them in uh, Kruger. Uh, they're much more of a desert animal. Uh, 
they can go months and months and months without drinking uh, but this one obviously they will use it um, the total population estimate now is is almost 400,000 animals very very strong populations in Namibia this again is an animal they're beginning to raise quite heavily as livestock in other words for sale uh, for meat and this is my favorite meat in the African continent I, I ate springbok, I ate hartebeest, and I ate oryx uh, or gemsbok, and by far this was my favorite, tender um, and very tasty. <clears throat> the gray reebok, um, not a species I expect you to know the scientific name for. Very straight horns. They're larger than a diker, um, but they're certainly not large antelope. Um, that animal's probably, oh, three feet tall. I did see a group uh, on mountain zebra. They're primarily a mountain species. Um, their estimate now is about 20,000. Um, somewhat like the clip springer, they're a mountain species but not don't need quite as much uh, rough terrain as the clip springer does. Okay, here is an animal that is extremely important if for no other reason because every carnivore in Africa depends upon it and that's Apocerus melampus and that's the Impala uh, this is the South African version of the gazelle these are a fantastic animal uh, uh, very large groups which this is a group here in Kruger very early morning and they are snorting like crazy because there's a leopard around uh, and we ended up finding the leopard a little later on uh, but they have a, a very uh, intense social we shouldn't uh, I know we're gonna see an amicala because they're we're gonna be and they're gonna be right outside our camp uh, they're all over the place but that's not their native range this is their native range uh, but they are one of the most common population currently estimated at about two million uh, uh, about a million and a half of those are the common impala. This is a black faced, which we won't see because they're over here in Namibia. I took this picture in Namibia. Uh, they are very hot water dependent and they are big time browsers. And uh, they also are a keystone species. They help control woodland uh, and shrub uh, reestablishment. They keep grasslands grasslands by by eating all the seedlings uh, as they are a browser. A waterbuck. So, uh, Cobus elliprimus. Uh, widespread all over sub Saharan Africa. Uh, population estimate about 200,000. Uh, like their name indicates, though, you're going to find them close to water. So, uh, the carnivores. You're going to find servals close to water. Water bucks are going to be close to water. Fortunately, there is a lot of water. Uh, species of least concern. This is a large antelope. You can see the female does not have horns. The male does. Um, they're great big guys. Uh, estimate, current estimate is about 200,000. Uh, they were eliminated within their former range due to hunting. Uh, and they also love farms because farms are irrigated and they have good green grass and what better thing for a grazer than a farm uh, but right now more than half of the 200,000 animals are in protected parks so their their status for the future is, is good it's a mountain reed buck and I really hope we see one of these uh, we could see one in in Kruger we could see a couple in um, in mountain zebra I did see them in mountain zebra national park they're interesting in their horns they look very much like a gray reebok in some ways but their horns actually curve front to the front um, redundica fulvivora fulvoruthula again I'm getting to the end about when I should be talking um, and so these are the mountain reebucks very small antelope again um, about three feet tall. Um, last two species, and then I will stop this one hour and 20 minute PowerPoint. Um, primates, Circopithecidae, Chlorocebus 
pygorythus. Pygorythus. Uh, this is the verbit monkey. And I don't know why I don't have verbit monkey written on there. Again, I thought I had fixed that. Um, this was going to be a very common monkey we see. You may have a great deal of affection for them at when you start. You may not like them so much by the time we're done. Um, they uh, are extremely smart. They're a primate. Uh, and they will steal you blind. If you leave some food available, uh, they will come and take it. And so you have to be watching your stuff. You leave your car keys on the table, they may come and take them up into the trees and who goes where where they're going to leave them. I literally had one. I walked into a cabin I was staying in. He got through the door right as I had the cabin door open, grabbed an apple, got back out the door before I could close it. Uh, they're very good at what they do. And they're common. I've seen them in towns. Verbit monkeys uh, are going to be everywhere. And then you have the baboons. And we have the Chakma baboon in southern Africa. Um, from the Zambezi Valley to the Capibri Strip, uh, mainly woodlands and savannas, steppes, subdeserts, they have to drink uh, so you don't find them out in the real harsh deserts. This is a group over in Namibia. They're actually watching the sun come up as I was. Uh, this is a group, this is interesting in that there was a leopard in this area and these males were coming over uh, to protect the younger. Um, this is a large group of baboons uh, on Kruger. Uh, you can see that you don't drive fast in the Kruger. Uh, you drive when the animals let you. Uh, primarily vegetarian, but they will eat small mammals. Uh, they'll even kill small antelope. Uh, matter of fact, Impala kind of hang out with, with baboons because uh, they both watch out for their major predator, which is leopards. Um, and Impala lose young fawns to baboons every year. Uh, but I guess they have, it's evolved such that it's, the behavior is worth it. Um, troops are going to average between 20 and 50 animals. You may see as many as 130. This is certainly bigger than 20 animals, closer to 50. Uh, Multi-male hierarchies are normal. Um, small troops are only going to have one male. Really no major threats other than they're shot because they're pests. Uh, and they do occasionally take a young child uh, from some of the small rural villages. And they have been documented as killing and eating uh, human babies. Um, so that's it for mammals of Africa. Um, birds is the next one. No scientific names on the birds. Papio or Sinus is the Chakma baboon. Um, quite a bit. There's still a lot of mammals I didn't cover. Bush babies, uh, a lot of small mammals, but I felt like this list was big enough. These are the ones I want you to be able to ID by sight. Uh, and these are the ones, the ones with the red. Again, you need to know that scientific name. Um, start getting on it because it's going to take a while, um, and good night.